I'm Ernie Meeks. You may have known me from Flying with Big Earn. I've been at Southwest for 12 years. I'm a Southwest captain. It's been a long journey for me. I've been flying airplanes since I was 14. So at last count, I'm 48. <laughs> so I've been flying about 34 years. First starting out, I was a flight instructor, kind of the typical civilian path. While I was in college, I entered ROTC and ended up getting a commission. So I flew for the Air Force for 20 years, flying C-5s and KC-135s. My last 14 years though, I was in the Air National Guard flying KC-135s. That gave me the opportunity to fly uh, on the outside as well. So uh, I picked up a job flying charter. I also flew for a large fractional before I got on with Southwest Airlines. Coming from a military family, you know, my, my father was in, my uncles were in. I had that long lineage of, of people to draw inspiration from. If I'm able to inspire my family, maybe I'm able to inspire someone else into aviation. I'm happy to do that. Oh yeah! Hey. My wife, no. she goes, we're, ha we're on our way to Orlando. She oh, goes, yeah. they're, look, they're filming. I look over, oh my God, that's big air. <laughs> you know, I wanted to expose my, my children to aviation. I had no intention of being a YouTuber or having any kind of social media presence. Sometimes you just need a mentor to help you go down the path without finding all the potholes. I see myself as, as that of a coach of, hey, you can get here and let's look at your resume. Let's look at your background and let's talk about some of the things you can improve to make yourself more competitive because we're all in a shared interest of bringing the best pilots to Southwest Airlines. I view my role as helping take care of our passengers, helping take care of my crew and just leading with heart, leading with love and making sure that my crew and my, my passengers know that I genuinely care about every single one of them and that I want their experience to be the best that it could possibly be. Can you guys believe what they put together? I mean, let's give our media team a round of applause. I was absolutely floored when they sent that to me and they said, let me know what you want to change. And I looked at it and I go, I don't want to change a thing because it, it's, it was just awesome what they did. So um, anyways, my name is Ernie Meeks. I've been uh, with Southwest about uh, 11 and a half years now. I just upgraded to captain, just like the, uh, the video said. And today I'm just going to go over a little bit about me and my journey on this path. Everybody has a journey in here. It's all different. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about my journey. Um, my parents, man, I couldn't ask for a better group. Uh, so my, my dad was in the military. Uh, he met my mom in Thailand and they just celebrated 50 years in February of marriage. <laughs> Super proud of them. Uh, I am actually surprised because my mom threatened to cut my dad's head off a couple of times, you know, being super Thai and just was going crazy with her. Uh, but anyways, it was, my upbringing was pretty normal. We were middle class family. My parents worked very hard to get me to where I was, uh, where I am today. Um, my dad was in the military, like I said. Uh, he was a maintainer. Uh, he was a master sergeant in the Air Force, and he maintained uh, F-4 Phantoms and a bunch of other airplanes. Actually, he maintained KC-135s was his first airplane uh, that he maintained in the Air Force, which I flew on my last half of my career. So um, I thought that was, that was kind of awesome. One of his airmen, when my dad was a master sergeant, uh, we were at Luke Air Force Base. One of his airmen underneath him actually was in my Air National Guard unit before I retired. And uh, he'd been in the Air Force, man, like 30 or almost 40 years, uh, this airman. And he talked about my dad. And it was very, very heartwarming to know my dad touched a lot of people's lives. So I kind of live with that legacy uh, of him. And it's, it's kind of what, what found, what basically shaped my life. Uh, he, the story behind my aviation career was, he brought me out to his squadron. I got to see a bunch of pilots in these green suits climbing on this big airplane and making a lot of noise on the runway taking off. And I thought, as a five-year-old, that is what I want to do. That's absolutely what I want to do. So um, with my dad, he, he put that seed in there and it's just kind of grown ever since. Um, you can't do it without family. My family is there. My oldest, Ashley, just graduated from uh, UND last year. 
So she is in the pipeline of uh, hopefully coming to us is kind of what I, I hope, but she will, I'll let her make her own path. But, uh, you know, my uh, wife has been kind of steadfast. Uh, she keeps me humble. She's Irish, so she, uh, she definitely keeps me humble when I, when I think I'm, I'm getting a little too high. But, uh, and my, my two little ones there by the Cirrus. Uh, the little one wants to fly, the older one, uh, she's kind of a little ambivalent, but we're gonna get her a private anyway. So my deal is <laughs> my kids are all gonna get their private license and what you do after that, that's on you, so. Growing up, I always wanted to fly airplanes, but I also wanted to, to play football too. So as you can see, I'm five foot nine, 190 pounds, and uh, I went to Arizona State. Um, here's a picture that I can show you that was uh, probably one of the only pictures I could show you from my time at ASU. But, uh, but this picture is one thing that stands out mainly. And it's because of my first lesson I want to teach you guys is show up prepared. Coach Bruce Snyder was the coach of the Arizona State football team back when we were in the Pac-12, or Pac-10, Pac-12 now. But uh, I was invited... My football career through high school, I got invited to go out to San Diego State University and participate in a passing tournament and was getting recruited. And my audacity was, wow, you know, I don't want to leave my friends. I'm from uh, Phoenix. I want to stay in Phoenix. I'll just walk on at Arizona State, right? No problem. Um, the difference is if you're not a sports person between playing in the WAC, a Division I-A school, and a Pac-10 Division I football team uh, in the same, in the same uh, schedule as USC and all those other guys. The difference is quite vast. So I showed up. I was very fast. I ran a 4-4, 4, 4, 4 5, 40, uh, yard dash, and um, I was quick. But that's kind of where it ended. Um, we were doing spring ball. I got invited out to, to go work on spring ball. Before I got invited out, I knew I was going. And I knew that um, this was going to be a little bit of a test. So I need to work on, work, you know, work on making sure I can make the team. So I worked on some of the things I wanted to work on. My strengths. I worked on my speed. Worked on my agility. Worked on my strength. What I didn't work on was my conditioning. And to play Pac-10 at the time, you needed to have all those in order. So what I did was I showed up, I was strong, I was fast. I could run the 40 and 4-5, four, 4-4. Four, four. And then we started conditioning drills. One of the conditioning drills involved as, as the weeks went on was uh, sprints. And they would say, okay, this sprint is gonna be 50 yards, go 50% speed. No one was going 50%. Everybody was going 100%. Um, as a walk-on, you are kind of the rookie of the team, so you did everything. You carried helmets and all that stuff. Um, Thursday, I'll remember the day, I'll always remember it, we were doing 100-yard sprints. And I told you my conditioning sucked. So the first 100-yard sprint, I went up. I was keeping up with all the uh, corners. Good. Turned around. We went back. I was kind of getting a little dinged, a little winded. Went up again, now I'm hurting. We came back, Coach Snyder is standing on the sideline, and I notice the kicker is kind of holed up and he's, he's holding his knee. And I knew if I went back again, I was gonna throw up all over the field, and that's not a good look, especially in front of the team. So I decided to fake that I had a knee injury, to which Coach looked exactly like that with his hands on his, his uh, hips and just crushed my soul with his, his look, his gaze. And that was it. I never got invited out. I was asked to leave, and I was done. Not because conditioning sucked, but because I gave up, and I showed up not prepared. That look is burned in my soul, and I think about it all the time. So when I approach things now, I have a two to one. Identify what your weakness is and work on that two to one compared to your strengths. So me going through training or anything in life, I find out what my weakness is and I work on it twice as hard compared to my strengths. Still work on your strengths, work on the weakness. Um,
Coach Snyder passed away from cancer, but he has no idea who I am. If he was alive today, he would say, I don't remember this guy. But that guy had an everlasting impression on me. And you guys have that same opportunity to the people that you're mentoring. And we'll get on to that here in a second. Um, relationships. So some people in the room know who that guy is, uh, that tall guy, redhead guy. Um, his name's Steve Hutchinson. Steve and I go all the way back to ASU. That picture on the left is us uh, in our, I think it was our sophomore year going on junior year of ROTC. So you go through field training and then that's kind of when you are giving your scholarship and you're gonna be going to the Air Force. So I remember seeing Steve uh, kind of on this journey to become a pilot and I thought, man, who's this dorky redheaded kid? That guy, has been my biggest advocate and my best friend ever since college. So the thing about relationships, you're gonna be going through this journey, you're gonna be headstrong, you're gonna be going as fast as you can, you're gonna be, you know, you're gonna have the tendency to kind of go your own way. Well, you're not gonna go your own way, you're not gonna make it without people in your life. And Hutch is one of those, those people. Um, when we met, we were competing for pilot training slots together. I'll tell you a little bit of a story about him. So there was only so many pilot training slots in the 90s. I think there was two. Uh, Hutch got one of them, and someone else got the other. I didn't get one. And during ROTC, we would wear Air Force wings in our, our cover, our hat. And that was going to be used when we graduated Pilot training, when we went to pilot training to graduate, we were gonna put those on our chest. So we carried them throughout our whole time and put them on. So our senior year, we get told whether or not we're gonna to go to pilot training. Hutch gets a pilot training slot, I do not. You know, it's, it sucked. And I was very upset that I didn't get one, but I had myself to blame. So what I did was I gave my, I reached in my hat, I gave Hutch my wings, and I said, I don't need these anymore. You take them. So Hutch, being the upstanding individual he is, he, uh, he held on to those wings. And when I finally got the opportunity to go to pilot training and graduated, he was uh, stationed in Korea, he was on A-10s at the time. He sent me a letter and a package. And the letter was, essentially I'm summarizing, he kept those wings because he knew I was gonna go to pilot training. He knew I was gonna get the opportunity. He believed in me more than I believed in me. And that's the kind of relationships you guys need to find on your journey. People that will believe in you. Because when that package came, and I was graduating, I think in a week, I opened it up, a pair of wings came out, and this letter. And it was one of the most uplifting, uplifting times in my life that I think about today. So what I think about now is how can I uplift other people? Because flying airplanes is a lonely experience, if you guys have felt that yet. When you're on the road, maybe you're not gelling with your captain, maybe you're not gelling with your FO or your crew, and you're just kind of by yourself. You're gonna need to rely on some relationships that you have in the past, right? And as you're on the come up, make sure you foster those. And it's not just about taking, it's about giving as well. So lesson two was, you know, relationships. Lesson three, if I could give it to you, is life's not fair or not. Life is not fair or unfair, it's just life. So my time in the military, I, uh, I got to go to pilot training like I told you. My pilot training story was, when I got to pilot training, I played with a chip on my shoulder, right? Like I've had a couple failures, I failed at trying to get on the football team. I failed at getting a pilot slot initially. I had failed my private pilot license. How many people have failed a check ride in here? Let me just show of hands. Okay, probably half. It sucks, right? It's not fun, it sucks. So when I showed up to pilot training, I finally got the opportunity to go. I went with the reserve, so I was gonna go fly C5s. I knew the airplane I was going. I was going to take everybody's heads off. I was gonna compete like no one, no one has ever competed before in my mind. So I got in, I, I did really well. Um, I had the opportunity to go fly fighters. So I told you I was in the reserve, so I already knew my assignment was a C5. Um, but if you did well enough and you impressed 
I guess, the leadership enough, they would give you the opportunity to go fly a fighter or at least compete for it. So I had that opportunity and you know, I talked it over with my family at the time because it would mean me going back on active duty and instead of having a reserve job where I can go get a airline job pretty quick, I would be stuck on active duty for probably 20 years. So after a lot of counsel and a lot of mentorship from a lot of people, I decided, yeah, let's do it. I'm gonna go fighters. So the Air Force worked their magic and active duty Air Force, is there any military guys in here? How many military guys? How many people know about the Air National Guard and the Reserve? How many people know the relationship between active duty, the Air National Guard, and the Reserve? Yeah. So active duty is like, yeah, this guy's good enough. We're going to put him in fighters. The Reserve's like, uh, we paid for a C-5 pilot. We want a C-5 pilot, sir. Thank you. Um, and the active duty said, nope, we're sending him in. So in between your T-30, at that time, T-37, and your follow-on, whether it was a T-1 or a T-38, uh, everybody was studying. You got a week off, but it's not a week off. We got our books, T-38, T-1. The books were massive on the T-1. So it was part of another reason I didn't want to go T-1s. So, hey, I'll do T-38s and we'll, we'll go that route. So. I got my books, we all studied, study sessions were at my house, I was ready to go. I knew my ops limits, bold face, I could take apart that airplane and put it back together. When one week, we went through all that. Day one happens, we're sitting, and it's called a B mission. We're learning about the T-38. All the students are in class, there's a table behind the students, and the flight commander's in there. Not a big deal, all the, all the other instructors are in there, not a big deal. The commander walks in. That's a big deal. When the commander walks in, there's something going on. And I kind of had a gut feeling that it was about me. Commander walks in, they look at me, they're talking. Anybody else have that? Like when people are talking about you, they're looking at you and they're talking to somebody else. Doesn't feel good. And you're like, hey, what's going on? Um, so they said, Lieutenant Meeks. I said, yes, sir. Grab your stuff, come with me. How many people have been on an airplane where you told a passenger, hey, we need you to grab your stuff and come with me, <laughs> right? That doesn't end well. Well, it didn't end well for me either. So I went into the commander's office. He said, hey, I'm sorry, we fought for you, but um, they, they're putting you back into T1s. Now, mind you, I know nothing about the T1. I haven't even read anything about it. I don't have my books. I don't have anything. So they said, we need to send you back to T1s now to catch up to your class or you could get washed back. No, I'm not washing back. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick it out. So I go over and I try to find out what is going on, what's happening, because no one's telling me anything. So I call my, uh, my mentor at the time, it was Colonel Ono, great guy. Uh, he said, Ernie, here's what happens in the military. When we decided to put you into T-38s, we kind of you know, basically did it on our own, thinking that we could just pull that off. Pilots do that, right? We see if we can pull it off. Well, they, they tried to pull it off. It didn't work. I guess uh, whoever was in charge of assignments at the time, I knew her name for a long time because I did not want to let it go, um, complained to her commander who complained to her commander who complained to the general, and then it went horizontal to the other general at AETC, and then it went down, and, you know, that's kind of how it, it worked out. There were some expletives in, in the explanation, but I'll, I'll not share that. Um, so anyways, I went over to T once. Now here's the, here's the good thing about this. Who knows where I would be right now? I got to come to Southwest Airlines earlier than I would have if I was on active duty. But the biggest thing is I got to meet someone who changed my life. So the guy on the right, the bald headed dude, was my T1 instructor. He was a FAPE. Does anybody know what a FAPE is in here? Yeah, it's first assignment instructor pilot. They're not, uh, they're not really highly looked upon. It's kind of a brotherly thing, but um, most people want to be taught by someone who's actually been there, done that. FAPES, they graduate from pilot training and they come back as instructors. It's kind of how it works. So when I got put over there, I had a very bad attitude. It went from you know, hunter killer to I'm just pissed off now because I worked hard to get where I wanted to be. I did everything I was supposed to do. 
and I got dealt this hand that I had no input over. So when I came over, Dusty Banker uh, basically sat me down. He said, hey man, here's the deal. You can either have this attitude and wash out, or you can change it and I can help you get through. Because mind you, I was a week behind. I knew nothing about the airplane. So Dusty would take his time to basically catch me up to the rest of my class. Time that he took out of his day where he really didn't need to. And Dusty Banker is my vice president of my company, MJets, right now. We kept in touch all this time. I helped him get on at Swift. I helped him get on here. He is someone, like we talked about before in the relationships, he was a mentor to me, even though he was lower rank and he was just getting into to the Air Force. He mentored me through a period of my life that was the worst at the time. I thought it was the worst thing ever. So you need a mentor when you're out there. You guys can't do it at all, alone. You can try. You'll get some amount of success, but you're not going to be able to do it alone. You're going to need someone who's been there, done that, or who just has the right attitude to help your attitude. We're all human. We're all going to have these bad days. We're all going to get pissed off. We're all going to, it's, it's what you do with that. Are you going to be able to just, hey, it's, it's fine. I'm going to be upset for a little bit, but I'm going to get over it because I got to keep moving forward. Or are you going to self-destruct? I was on the path of self-destruction. I'll tell you that right now. And that man helped me through that. So a mentor, you need a mentor. Doesn't matter where they come from. It doesn't matter if it's in your industry or not. It could be your parents, it could be your grandfather. It could be someone that you just randomly met. So the importance of mentorship to me has been big. And because of those experiences, um, you know, I've been doing interviews at Southwest for 10 years. In the Air National Guard, I've been doing it for 12. Uh, I had a lot of time looking at resumes. Actually, this is a true story. Last night, uh, as I was taking a shower, I was doing math on my little window there. Uh, I went to ASU, so my math skills aren't great. But I estimated I've looked at over 7,000 resumes in my time being an interviewer. But the best thing about that was how many people I was able to help along the way. So when you're looking for a mentor, remember, you guys are mentors too. There's someone that's behind you that's looking for, hey, just give me a little push. You know, I can ride this bike. I just need a little help. That will help them. Like I said in the video, I want to make sure you guys go down the path without hitting all the potholes that I hit. So mentorship is a big thing. So both receiving and then giving. Even if you're a CFI, even if you're starting out in a, as a private pilot, in pilot training, we would help each other, right? Everybody gets together. We have study sessions in our rooms. It was a team effort, and it's gotta be the same way there that for you guys as well. If you're being mentored, mentor somebody else, one person can make the difference in, in their life and in their career. And also it's intrinsic too. The more you help, the more you give, the more you get. Not that you go in looking for that. I never went in looking to be a YouTuber or anything like that. I honestly wanted to help my daughter not quit flying. That was the reason. And then I've had some of you guys come up to me and say, hey, it's been an inspiration on showing us how to do this. So I kept going. I do it for you guys. I don't do it for me. I mean, the guy that puts everything together is right there, Luke. Right? Another relationship. Someone, I, I gotta, I gotta tell the story really quick, Luke. So, I, one, once my daughter continued on and she was gonna graduate and everything was good, I was gonna end flying with Big Earn, right? Like, mission accomplished, let's move on. Um, but I, I had a lot of y'all come up and say, hey, you know, this is very helpful, this is very inspiring. And it also takes a lot of time. So I put out, I think, on YouTube or Instagram or something like that. I said, hey, I need help. You know, I, I kind of want to keep this going, but I need somebody to help edit. Well, Luke, who happened to be in the hangar next door to me in Scottsdale, 
answered the call. And uh, I don't know, you guys have social media. Like, I'm kind of an idiot with social media, believe it or not. Luke is the brains behind it. He reached out, and I said, hey, yeah, you know, you're right here. Let's just let's give it a shot. So Luke is the whole reason, and I, I I'll tell you right now, he's the whole reason behind uh, the success of Flying with Big Earn. Without him, without that relationship that we have, the Flying with Big Earn wouldn't be around. So um, another relationship again. So to wrap kind of all this up, when you're out there, and this is kind of how I see it now, I didn't always see this, right? I was young, I was hair on fire, I was, you know, take no prisoners, get what I need. Um, and then I got older, <laughs> 48, I look back with extreme gratitude. And this is something that I wish I could grab my 25 year old self and go, hey look, number one, it's not all about you. Number two, make sure you're mentoring people. Number three, make sure you build a team around you. And number four, and this is a big takeaway that I want you guys to have, this master caution represents your time. The time that you have working towards your goals, the time that you have spending with your family, the time that you have working on your physical fitness, this is represents, represents time to me now. Again, being 48, I'm grateful for everything that I have. I have a great company that I work for, I started a great company with good people. I got the opportunity to fly a lot of stuff. But it can be all gone in one doctor's visit. So this master caution to me is time. Be possessive of your time. As you guys are on the come up, it's normal and it's supposed to happen. You're supposed to be gunning, running and gunning. Go after it, get it, work hard. But know that there is a work-life balance that I did not take initially. And it was with my family. I spent a lot of time running and gunning when I should have had a little bit more work-life balance. And I'll tell you today, and I'll look every one of you in the eye when I say, I would give it all up to have that time back. All of it, my business, Southwest, everything because I didn't have the proper work-life balance. It's super important. If you listen to anything I said today, listen to that, because it will be extremely impactful on your lives forevermore. So, don't want to end on a bad note, <laughs> but I just wanted you guys to know the life lessons that I learned along the way. So number one, show up prepared. Everything you do, not just flying, everything. Number two, build relationships. You never know who is gonna help you along the way or who you can help along the way. Number three, life's not fair or unfair, it's just life. Stuff's gonna happen to you. How you deal with it is the real meat and potatoes behind that. It's gonna set you on a, traje a trajectory that will either give you success or it will give you failure. You will either blame other people or you'll blame yourself. And if you blame yourself, you can always fix yourself, right? You need a mentor, number four. You also need a mentor. You need to mentor other people. This wine world is small. And the more you mentor other people, the more people mentor you. This, this is a family. We're aviators. We're different. Mentor each other. Have a mentor. You don't need to hit every pothole. Your mentor can help you with that. And the fifth and most important thing is have that work-life balance. Please, again, that's my number one takeaway for you guys. Have work-life balance. If you don't, none of this stuff matters. None of it. Anyways, I hope that, I hope that gives you guys a little bit of value. Um, I just really wanted to point out uh, some of the lessons that I learned along the way and, and what you know, maybe that can help you in your career as you go along. Whether that's flying or not, look, I'm a Southwest pilot, I want you to come to us, but I really, honestly, genuinely want you to go to a place that you are gonna be happy with. Whether that's us, I hope, 
or another carrier, or you want to fly corporate or cargo or anything like that, I want you guys to achieve your dreams. Hopefully this will